Hello to all of you um, coming from, you know, across the United States and around the world. I um, want to welcome you to our uh, virtual session today. And um, we are very, very um, fortunate to have a, a couple of colleagues um, from the Office of uh, Health Professions Advising with us. I'm going to actually just give it maybe a little 30, 45 more seconds um, before we begin to just allow people to trickle in and then we'll we'll start. Um, so thank you for being here. We'll be with you in a, in a, in a moment. All right, I think we can we can begin. Um, so again, uh, welcome to our um, virtual session for today on Monday. Uh, my name is Solomon Enos. I'm Senior Associate Director of Undergraduate Admissions here. Um, again, on behalf of Dean Gutentag, we wanna congratulate you um, for um, being admitted to Duke. Um, we're, we are so happy that you are joining us this evening and um, and we're, we're just really excited to, to provide you more information and to have, again, our colleagues from the Office of Health Professions Advising. So we do have the director and the associate director of the Office of Health Professions Advising with us, um, Alyssa Perz and Brittany Morhack. And I'm actually going to turn it over to them um, and they can start. And actually, you know what? I need to do a few things before we we go. So let me let me go through a few slides before we turn it over to them. So a few housekeeping things. So Duke encourages persons with disabilities to participate in its programs and activities. If you would like to request accommodation services for an information session, please contact Idella Hackett at idella.hackett.edu or 919-684-0186 to arrange uh, these for a later date. And also, we are recording this um, this session today, and, and it will be in, available to um, to you uh, in the next day or two on our YouTube channel, our, our admissions YouTube channel. So again, we are we're here today to to, to give you more information about um, pre health advising, um, and I'm going to turn it over to to my colleagues now. Thank you. Let us get our slides up here. All right, looks like they are ready to go. Uh, well, congratulations again to all of you on getting accepted to Duke. We're really excited to see you. Um, my name is Alyssa Purs. I'm a senior associate dean in Trinity College, a lecturer in the biology department, and I direct the Office of Health Professions Advising. And I'm joined tonight by Ms. Morhack, the Associate Director. And we're gonna tell you a little bit about the work of our office and how we help um, students prepare, prepare for health careers. So if I could have the next slide. Our mission is to partner with undergraduate students as well as alumni in both um, the undergraduate colleges, Pratt and Trinity. Uh, and we serve those students who are pursuing careers in healthcare. Um, our goals are twofold. Um, not only do we want you to develop into being the best uh, future healthcare professional, but it's really important to us that you become your best, most authentic self as a person, and not just somebody who's passing through Duke on their way to a health career. Um, so we will uh, work with students um, to become excellent applicants, but we also want you to get the best out of Duke and really enjoy these four years because we're, we're confident that that will also translate into being a competitive applicant. If I could have the next slide, please. So um, it feels a little unfair to go from the rigorous admissions process you guys have all just been through 
to talking about the next one. Um, but oftentimes in our office, we start with the end in mind and work backwards in, in thinking about how do we support students um, when it's time for them to get admitted. So we thought we'd start with our acceptance data for the last class of applicants to medical schools. Um, these are the students that started medical school this past fall. Um, our office supported just a little over 300 applicants. Uh, our applicants, um, of them, 78% were accepted to medical school. Just to give you the point of reference nationally, um, the number for all applicants was 42%. Um, so while these numbers change a little bit, it's very typical for Duke's accepted percentage to be about double the national average. Um, a lot of that has to do with the really wonderful students we work with and then the, the work we do with them on top of it. Um, just to give you some of the numbers, uh, our mean MCAT is a 516 compared to the average of a 510 across the, the country. Um, but our students get accepted across a very wide range. Um, our lowest acceptance student had a 494 and our highest had a 527 on a scale that goes up to 528. Um, our students averaged a 3.7 science or biology, chemistry, physics, math GPA, and a 3.79 overall GPA. Um, but again, we had a wide range. Um, our lowest was a 2.91. And the asterisk there means the student didn't do any um, uh, post-undergraduate uh, work. This was the, the GPA that got them accepted. Some other students with lower GPAs will go on and do post back programs um, at the graduate or undergraduate level. So we didn't include those here. And then obviously the high end of the range was um, a four point. Um, we share these data though to show that um, you don't have to be perfect and that metrics aren't the only thing that schools are looking for. Um, I was in an undergrad about 30 years ago, considered pre-med and back then, um, and now I'm talking to the parents and the audience, back then metrics were much stronger drivers of acceptance. Um, schools now engage in what they call holistic forms of review. So metrics, while important, they're not the end all be all and they um, students uh, can shine in other ways. And I think that's one of the ways in which um, Duke offers lots of opportunities for our students to individuate and shine and become very appealing applicants for a range of schools. If I could have the next slide, please. So one of the questions we often get uh, from um, prospective students is where do students matriculate to medical school? Um, so we took uh, the schools that, it, that matriculated three or more Duke undergrads in that same cohort and put their um, schools on here. While we have some variations year to year in the schools that will be represented here, um, Duke School of Medicine is always at the top. They about 20 to 30% of their incoming classes will be Duke undergrads. We understand from talking to peer institutions that their medical schools aren't quite as generous with their undergrads where, you know, maybe three, four will get accepted. So to have, you know, 20 to 30 of our students going to Duke Med reliably every year um, is, is really fabulous for our students. Um, and then of course, because we're in North Carolina, have a lot of state residents, um, UNC Chapel Hill School of Medicine is um, number two on our list with somewhere between seven to 10 pretty reliably every year. Um, but this is an impressive set of, of schools, also shows where we have a lot of state residents from Texas and Florida and Virginia, uh, South Carolina. Um, but really, uh, we've got a lot of folks going to private schools um, out of Duke as well. Um, if I may have the next slide, please. Um, so the other thing, since we know we've got um, folks in the audience uh, who um, might wonder a little bit uh, more about our acceptance rate, um, as I indicated earlier, about 80% of our students year over year are accepted. Sometimes it's above 80, sometimes it's a little bit lower, but it hovers right around that. Um, so we don't see a lot of variation um, year over year. But the other number we really want to impress on um, students and families is that 80% of our students are taking a gap year between Duke and um, 
and uh, medical school. And um, the, the, the top tier <laughs> medical schools, um, we are hearing more and more that students are taking two gap years. So we want to get this word out um, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, our students do really well. If you've been through a selective admissions process for undergrad, you are going to fare well through undergrad. Um, if you continue doing the sorts of things you're doing, um, you will be successful on the other end. And our office is here to, to guide the way. Um, the other is that medicine is a complex profession that requires a lot of maturity. Um, we're seeing a lot of healthcare providers uh, burn out and things like that. So more life experience um, as delivered by these gap years can really um, help to increase your competitiveness. So our juniors who apply typically get into their really top-notch state schools, but um, it's our, our folks that are seniors and alumni that tend to be getting into those most competitive schools. And, and those numbers bear out if you look at the who's getting admitted to those, those top schools. Um, I think uh, University of Michigan said 90% of their incoming students took a gap year. 50% of those students took two gap years. And I think those top 25 schools, those are pretty typical numbers. Um, so we, the, the good news is, is that because of this reality, we are really well situated to support students um, for making alumni applications. And our, we work really closely with our career center to help students make those gap year plans. So, um, I, you know, that's um, just sort of one of the, the realities. Now I'm going to turn things over to uh, Ms. Moorhack to talk a little bit now backing up to what you can expect when you arrive at Duke and are interested in health professions and work with our office. Thank you so much, Dean Paris. <laughs> So we are a fully staffed office. Um, we really wanted to kind of take a step back at this point and talk about how we get there. All of these beautiful outcomes, we get to support wonderful students, but how does that happen? What, is those, what do those four years look like? So we are um, a, an office, office staffed with six full-time staff members in addition to additional advisors that support the work we do. Um, we support all the health professions you see on the screen and we really want to encourage students to explore early on in their time um, because healthcare is a complex um, career path. And we do have specialized advisors for certain um, pathways just because we want to make sure that those pathways have adequate support as well. Many of them are alumni who went to Duke themselves and um, really enjoy giving back to our students. Um, we support students right from when you arrive. Um, and sort of looking at the different pathways, we think about different focus in each year. So when we take a step back and we look at what does this look like during your time with us? In the first year, we do a lot of group advising and drop-in advising, and that's because we really want your focus in your first year in being a Duke student and building your community. And building that community looks like getting to know your peers, your faculty, the staff on campus that are supporting you in lots of ways, including our office. And we find that doing that in a group formatting really helps you do that. And we know that that first year transitioning into Duke is the most important thing you can do on your pre-health journey and for your personal development at Duke. When you become a sophomore, we have in these check-in action items. So we um, host some group advising sessions where we help people walk through what it looks like in looking at what your first year has looked like at Duke and where you're going next. Um, and we really feel like it's important to pause there and look at what you've learned from the first year so that you can craft a big comprehensive plan that helps you get where you wanna go. Um, and we really want that to be built upon what you've learned about yourself and other people in your first year. So we continue to offer drop-in advising and you can have individual appointments with our advisors as well. One of the things that I think is a hallmark of our advising here in Duke HPA is what happens as you sort of progress through your time, as you continue to work with your advisor and your junior, senior, and all the way through your alumni years. We really want to help you create this unique personalized path to your 
career plan. And so that might be spending time thinking about how your choices look unique to your goals and to your passions. Um, so we continue to offer the advising appointments um, five years past graduation. You just saw earlier from Dean Purs how 80% or more of our applicants take a gap year. And so we are able to advise students all the way through. I like to call it white coat advising. We are all in with you until you put your white coat on. Um, so that includes a really comprehensive application preparation plan. We have um, a curriculum that supports preparation of your application. We do one-on-one -on -one appointments, and then we do advising all the way through the cycle as you manage what your individual cycle looks like. Um, it's really important to us that you have this authentic narrative that puts forth who you are and what your goals are. So what does this preparation actually look like? Um, the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, so many people will talk with us that pre-health is all about the courses. And that is a big component. There are certain courses that you will take to prepare yourself intellectually for your career path. But there's this other piece that's becoming more and more important, which is are the experiences. How are you exploring your career path? How are you being sure that medicine or healthcare as a whole is in the thing that you want to do and how you're developing those uh, pieces in a, your experiential preparation? And all of this connects to the core competencies. So the AAMC for students who are pre-med has this list of 17 competencies that medical schools are looking for when you come in the door. And we really want to help Duke students while they're here for their four years, think about what types of experiences and course selection might help them develop those competencies. So when you put together strong coursework plus strong experiences, it leads to this ability to demonstrate to medical schools or really any healthcare profession, these strong core competencies that you've developed, grown, and stretched during your time at Duke. For many folks, they'll look at this long list of things we're talking about, courses and experiences and competencies, and feel like there's all these things that are required of them. And while there are some things that we'll do because you need to have that experience or have that course to prepare for your pathway, one of the things we really like to highlight are all the choices you have as a pre-health student. So within the coursework, within your experiences, there might be these big ideas, this framework in which you will work um, into making your choices. But you do have a lot of individualized choices about the types of experiences you choose, the types of courses you choose. And kind of going back to our mission statement, that's how we help each of uh, the students on this call really become the provider and person that they want to be in the future. So what is the Duke difference? Um, in addition to our office, there are lots of wonderful programs and choices here at Duke that help our pre-health students develop. Um, some of these things you might have heard of, some of these things might be things you want to investigate in the coming days at Blue Devil Days and beyond. Um, our focus program gives our first year students a lot of community building and some space where they can really explore intellectual interests in an interdisciplinary way. Um, a lot of our pre-health students will look into program two, which is the ability to look at your entire course set um, and kind of craft a plan that's specific to your intellectual interests. And we have lots of students who engage with graduation with distinction, which is the process in which doing a senior thesis in research. Um, so all of these fit into spaces that a lot of pre-health students have interest in and are looking to stretch those muscles. Um, I think the hallmark of our non-medical community service at Duke is Duke Engage in our Durham and community offices and then our service learning courses. So our students are meshing together experiences here in Durham and and abroad into what does it mean to serve our community? What does it mean to understand a community? And all of that plays really well into pre-health students who might be looking to understand the community component in healthcare. For patient engagement, getting to spend time with patients in a healthcare setting, we do have an assisted living and hospital volunteering program. Uh, you can't see out my windows, but the hospital is literally right behind our offices where Dean Pers and I are sitting. So it is very walkable, very close. Um, we have a Duke Help Desk program where a lot of our students um, learn a lot about social determinants of health and helping um, patients navigate the different systems that impact their health. We have an Adopt-a-Grandparent program and um, an EMS program on campus as well. 
Shadowing is sort of the other side of the coin when we think about understanding the profession. There's the patient engagement, spending time directly with patients, and then there's understanding what the actual career of a physician or whatever clinical provider you're looking into is. Um, we have some amazing programs at Duke. Uh, Reimagining Medicine thinks about what does it mean to take care of a patient wholly with all the different teammates um, in healthcare, not just the clinical provider. And then many of our students will spend um, time with the Marine Scholars and medicine program, particularly our students who have a strong interest in marine life, um, will find really interesting intersections there. And then our office um, has a shadowing program that helps do the clearance so that you can shadow at Duke Hospital. As I'm sure you've heard by this point, research is something that's important to our undergraduate population and our general population here at Duke. And we have lots of wonderful programs that our students um, take part of. Muser is a great database for students to find research opportunities. I love to highlight VIP because it's research in psychology. We have lots of pre-health students who will major in psychology. There is no pre-med major here at Duke or really anywhere. So um, this is allowing your intellectual choices to shine through. And then we have interdisciplinary teams and vast connections, which help students work with different teammates across disciplines and um, across different experience uh, sort of time points in their development and really understanding what research looks like in the real world. Um, and then when we think about teamwork and leadership, we have hundreds of student organizations and the things that our students tell us on a daily basis about how they're working on teams with their peers to do dance competitions and put on art and theater and serve our community kind of blow my mind on a daily basis. Um, they are such impactful experiences for our students and they shine in how they are passionate about their community and themselves and their um, their hobbies. And then we have a teaching fellowship and a leadership program here at Duke where a lot of our students find spaces to grow these little niche areas that they might be really interested in that also sometimes find their way into their healthcare um, interests in the long run. So I'm just going to pause and leave this because I, I think, you know, when Dean Pers and I put these slides together, it's a lovely reminder for us of all the different choices our students have. Um, like I said, we spend a lot of time talking with our students as they're preparing to apply. And, you know, these are the experiences that students are regularly telling us to make a difference in how they see the world, how they see themselves, how they see healthcare, um, and how they see the impact that they want to make on the world when they when they leave Duke on the other side. I think we just really wanted to reemphasize at this point that there are a lot of different choices along the way, whether it's your coursework or your experiences. And our goal in this office and in this team is to always partner with individuals. Um, you all are zooming in with us from all over the world and the country, and your goals will be to go all over the world and the country. Um, I love to highlight to people that we send students all across the country to lots of medical schools. Your goals are different. Your values are different. Your experiences coming to Duke are really different. And what you want to do on the other side, even if it falls under the giant umbrella of healthcare provider, will look really different. And our goal is not necessarily to tell you what to do or how to do something, but to partner with you to help you make choices that feel authentic and to the problems within healthcare you want to solve and the way you want to take care of people in the future. Uh, DMP, anything to add that I missed? You're muted. Sorry. No, I perfect job. Thank you. All right. We'd like to leave lots of time for questions. Um, we know that there are a lot of them. So are there any that you want to start with? Um, I guess I'm just gonna start at the top. Um, we've got a question from an international student um, wanting to know if they'll be considered an international applicant. And that's, that's a great question. Um, if you will be on a visa for medical school, um, that, can be a, a bigger hurdle than if you um, are a have a green card or are a U.S. citizen, um, and I think is more difficult in medical school than um, it is for undergrad, uh, especially if you want to attend medical school in the U.S. Um, there are lists online of schools that will consider uh, students here on visas, and our office is really well versed in those schools around the globe 
which can represent um, alternative pathways for students to apply to medical school. So a good mix of those schools, which will consider international applicants, as well as um, the global options can be a really good strategy for a student who is on a visa. And depending on what part of the world you're from and where you aim to practice, we'll kind of determine our advising on that, that point. Great, thanks. So the next question looks um, to talk about balancing double major in the sciences and outside experiences. Um, as you heard us talk about a lot, holistic is important. There's lots of different pieces that we're helping students think through. And I think that we have students who double major, but I think a lot of pre-health students will take a look at the big picture and find that they might find that a major and a minor help satisfy their intellectual curiosity, leaving a little bit more space for experiences. I think it also depends on what those exper outside experiences look like. So a student who might want to study abroad, their academic plan might look a little bit different than somebody who plans to stay domestically for all four years at Duke. Um, I think, is it possible? Sure. I think that it is, you're highlighting one of the reasons we have so many students take a gap year is that when they lay out what they would like to achieve and what experiences they'd like to engage with intellectually and outside of the classroom, having a full four years of Duke lets you do those things at a different pace and really highlight those growth and choices um, on your application to medical school. But we really encourage people to think about why they're making the choices they're making, whether it's one major and a major minor or a double major. Um, and I think we have students who double major, but more times than not, our pre-health students will take a good look and say, you know, I can do a major and minor and sort of take away from that experience exactly what I'm hoping to. And, and this is also a good place for things like interdepartmental majors, where you shorten the list of classes that you would need for a double major, or if it's truly interdisciplinary, our program too, where you design your own major um, can be really uh, useful um, my goal as a pre-health advisor is always to free up as many electives, and every time you take on pre-health and, and a major, you're looking at lists of classes, some of which, um, you know, may not be your choice. Um, so trying to maximize those opportunities can be really helpful. Um, I guess I'll tackle the next question about how long does EMS training um, take? I if you're doing it during a semester, um, it can be a semester long course. Um, frequently, these are coming out of um, places like community colleges, so they're on a semester schedule. Um, I will be really honest and say locally, we have got saturation um, of the demand for EMS shifts and our Duke EMS service. Um, it takes very few students every year and is very limited in what they can do. Um, so we're exploring other pathways for students to get that hands-on experience. And um, what we're seeing show up really well in applications are folks that get certified nurses aid training um, and then work. There are so many positions at um, assisted living, in hospitals, um, whether you've got a CNA or an EMT a certification, our emergency department will hire you as an emergency department technician. So um, some entry level jobs do require some kind of certification as a gateway in. Um, so because of the greater opportunity with CNAs, we're working with one of our local hospitals at Duke to um, make that accessible for students. And we think we'll help them also uh, fill some critical um, staffing shortages along the way, and it'll be win-win. All right, I'll take the next one um, about gap years and what counts. This is a great question. Um, so as gap years before college also become a, a growing trend for some of our students, when we talk about students taking gap years, we do mean in between graduating from your undergraduate degree and matriculating to medical school. Um, so when we look at things like 80% of our students are taking a gap year, that means after their time at Duke. Most medical schools are going to ask that your application to medical school start with your time at Duke. Um, there might be some caveats around that, but generally speaking, when we talk to schools, they're looking for your time at Duke and beyond. Um, I think this sounds like a little bit of a different type of situation, but for the great majority, what we tell people is anything you've done prior to Duke is likely not going to be something that's presented as part of your candidacy to medical school. Sorry, I'm 
trying to send an answer. Um, I just dropped into the discussion. Someone asked for a list of classes for uh, required for medical school. And I'm gonna blend that with um, the next question about what fraction of Duke undergrads typically end up pursuing pre-med um, and medical career. Um, I think that's as opposed to other careers in the health professions. And um, you probably hear us talk about pre-health and we listed all those areas, but um, probably I would I would say something like easily 95% of our students are, are aiming for medical school and will wind up um, going that direction. So you can see how we shift very quickly to um, from pre-health to pre-med, um, but our really working to expand the opportunities for students um, in other areas. We have a, a relatively large number of professional programs. So we partner with our School of Nursing and Occupational Therapy. Um, we have the first physician assistant program in the country. So uh, we, we try to leverage some of those um, relationships on campus. Physical therapy, we've got a, a great um, alumna who uh, leads the advising in that area and the student group. So, um, you know, even though, you know, the bulk of our students are aiming for medicine and we're supporting them that way, um, we've, you know, supported students on in genetic counseling and optometry and um, things that as they come up. So we're, we're willing to pivot and be supportive. Um, I want to connect this to the list of classes that I just posted. Um, I grabbed this off our website. And um, we haven't said it yet here, so I, I'm going to introduce the phrase, <laughs> it depends. Um, so although we can give our pre-med students a really nice list of courses like the one I've shared, um, I think you really have to treat this list like realistic fiction. It represents common requirements at medical schools across the country. Um, if you're going dental or vet, you'll see very similar kinds of things with some mild variations. Um, other health professions deviate a little bit um, more from this, but everybody, regardless of what profession they wanna go into, needs to start fairly early looking at the requirements of individual schools. Um, and that's just because they change, they can be so different. Um, I love to share, uh, you know, the, the great North Carolina rivalry of Duke and UNC. Those medical schools could not be more different in their approach to prerequisite courses. Duke is easy. They have no requirements. As long as you do well on the MCAT and they suggest you take biochemistry, you'll probably be okay. Um, they're able to select for students that have really strong GPAs and MCAT scores um, because of because they don't have any kind of state requirement. UNC, on the other hand, matches their requirements much more in alignment with their undergraduate curriculum. So you'll see social sciences classes, humanities classes. Um, it can be challenging for our engineers who are not paying attention to what the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill wants from the beginning. You have a few social science humanities electives at Duke and you need to kind of be paying attention to what this school wants and how you're using those um, if you're a North Carolina resident. Um, and then across the country, there are some schools that want psychology. Um, one school in Arizona has an undergraduate major in physiology, so they want a couple courses in physiology. All of these things kind of get locally determined. If you're not from North Carolina or Arizona, you may not care what those schools are requiring, um, but it's very helpful for you to start with your state schools and then look beyond that. Um, so I reassure those students again who are not pre-med, although we have nice lists of courses for pre-meds on our website, it's because we advise so many of them, we're familiar with them, but we can really mislead our pre-health, our pre-med students um, uh, away if they're not paying attention to what some of those exceptional courses that aren't on this list might be. Um, so that's one of those things we do early in advising is really introduce students to this concept, get them out looking at med school websites. There's all kinds of other things they'll run into and benefit from reading and getting to know. We're also um, doing a really good job, I think, through our social media, getting students to go to info sessions about schools so they start to absorb this information early on and then can write better secondary applications that are really targeted toward individual schools and increase their odds of getting interviewed and accepted.
Right. So the next question asks about gap years and what do our Duke students do to strengthen their applications for med school? So the first thing uh, we like to share is that what you do in your gap year is usually not considered very strongly on your application. Um, so to take a step back and look at the timeline, Duke HPA starts working with students who are going to apply to medical school in October or November. And then you will submit your applications to medical school in May. So that is several months of support from us as you draft your application and work on it. Our timeline is a little bit earlier than some of the other institutions um, across the country. And that is because we hear from our students and alumni how much that time makes a difference in being able to craft a really strong personal application, which we know makes a difference for our candidates. Um, so you'll submit your application in May. It's usually the end of May. Anything you do after you submit your application likely does not go on your application. So when we talk about the advantages or what helps you uh, with a gap year being successful in the application cycle, what we're talking about is being able to have your senior year at Duke on your application. So when you apply directly without a gap year, you submit your application at the end of your junior year. So that means any leadership roles that you'll have for your senior year don't go on your application. It means if you're doing graduation with distinction, that's likely not going on your application either. And so the gap year is a time where you can continue to evolve your um, understanding of your motivation and what that looks like. We always encourage people to be doing things that feel a little bit like the weaker parts of their candidacy because it can help you grow and develop right stronger secondaries over the summer. And then in interviews, give you new exciting things to talk about and or potentially send updates. But when medical schools are really looking at the holistic of, um, assessment of your candidacy, they're going to be looking at what you submit in May, not necessarily what comes after that. But our students do amazing things in their gap years. Um, so if you can think it, dream it, one of our students has probably done it. Uh, so we have lots of students who spend a year or two doing research, um, whether that's at an institution like Duke, Duke itself. We have a lot of students who will spend uh, take two gap years and spend those years at the NIH doing something called the IRTA Fellowship. Um, in that case where you take two gap years, your first year out of Duke does go on your application. Um, so IRTA is a popular choice for that reason. We have students who spend time taking care of patients. There are um, fellowships and jobs that uh, regularly recruit Duke students and alumni. And so we advertise those through our weekly listserv when they come to our steps and our doors. Um, and then we have students who go and do a graduate program, sometimes because they're hoping to enhance their academics, sometimes because they really want to pick up something like an MPH uh, before they start medical school. We have students who are often um, awarded competitive fellowships, and so they might be abroad. I'm working with several students right now who are finishing um, some of those fellowships and will be coming back to the U.S. at the end of the year and then applying to medical school. Uh, we have students who serve in things like AmeriCorps, Vista Corps, Peace Corps sometimes, and then come back and apply. So this is another space where being able to advise five years post-graduation for us means that our, our advisees can go do really interesting things and then decide to apply to medical school and still have support from our office and our team. Um, so like I said, if you can dream it, it's probably been done by one of our students. They do really, really fascinating things in their gap year. Um, and I think the number one thing I hear from our, our alumni who take gap years are, wow, I just really enjoyed having a year where, yes, I was still in the application phase, but I got to grow in a different way. I got to not be a student for, our, for a minute and kind of breathe and relax and recharge for medical school in a really different way. I don't think we've ever heard a student regret taking a gap year, um, but when we do panels of students who took gap years and didn't, um, we'll sometimes hear the envy from those students who didn't take gap year. Um, one of the big trends that we are seeing is uh, a shift prompted by the pandemic is for students to get work experience, hands-on experience delivering healthcare through work. Um, so that is often a big driver and consideration when people are planning gap years if they um, have not had intensive patient engagement experiences during undergrad. Um, the next question is, does Duke provide opportunities to study abroad while staying on the pre-med track and still being competitive? 
Um, I have not seen the numbers, but Duke has got um, really high study abroad rates, above 50%. Um, the numbers used to be that our pre-meds studied abroad at the same rates as the rest of our um, undergraduate population. Uh, so we've got um, really terrific support for that. The one caveat is many of the medical schools will not accept foreign um, credits. So we tell our students, you know, figure out a way to study abroad and not take any pre-health requirements while you're abroad. This works in our students' favor, I think, because they're not taking those time-intensive lab science classes that uh, have, have a lot of work and problem sets. So they can really immerse themselves in the local setting, um, take classes in their major, take classes in their distribution requirements. Um, I think our global education office does a fabulous job of working with our School of Engineering to create opportunities in summer or semesters for our engineers to study abroad. Um, certainly the kind of cultural broadening, the adaptability and resilience that living someplace else um, requires of you and just those the soft skills that you'll develop um, navigating another culture become assets. Um, and if you're studying abroad in another language, you're just getting that immersive fluency that um, can also help you to communicate in, in a, a, another language. Um, so we think Duke does a really terrific job of this. Um, we privilege study abroad credits. Um, as transfer credits and, and things like that to really facilitate um, these rich opportunities. Uh, so our office encourages students to make a plan and study abroad. Um, if it's possible to shadow or volunteer in healthcare settings, it also helps you to get um, a comparative view of health systems. And you know, one of the reasons why you go and and live or study someplace other than where you you live is you start to understand the cultural assumptions that you come from. And so seeing another health system helps you to understand our health system um, even better. There are several questions that kind of all sit in the engineering space. So I'll talk a little bit about Pratt, our School of Engineering next. Um, I do not off the top of my head have a rate of how many engineers are pre-med or pre-health in general, but we definitely support a fair-ish amount of engineers. Um, I started my morning with one of my former engineers who's now an M1 who stopped in to say hi. Um, so our engineers who find that intersection of medicine and engineering really fascinating and intriguing to them are definitely finding the intellectual space in, in Pratt to combine those interests. I think one thing we always highlight for folks is that medical schools look comprehensively at your application and holistic. And so they will see that you're an engineer, but they'll be more interested in why you made those choices than anything else about a about a metric or a grade, they're really just looking for students to choose majors that they find interest in. And so um, when we think about why would you choose engineering, it's got to be because the engineering piece is really interesting and fascinating to you. I don't think that engineering helps or hurts being a pre-med. It is just a choice that you're making along the way. Um, engineering courses don't always go into what's called your BCPM, which is your biology, chemistry, physics, and math GPA, but our engineering students definitely take a little bit more of those courses um, to prepare for the engineering courses. And it's that BCPM um, GPA that some medical schools will look at in comparison to your your cumulative GPA. And so when we're thinking about grades and things of that nature, we're really just looking at the big picture of all those things. We want you to find a major where you where you can thrive, where you feel like you're challenging yourself, but also that you are finding, finding spaces and courses that are really intellectually stimulating for you. And I think that's the most important thing for medical schools and for our office. Um, and like I said, we advise particularly biomedical engineers on a fairly regular basis. I don't know that I would say we have a ton of other engineers who are also pre-health, but our BME students um, definitely find their way to the pre-health office on a, on a regular basis. Um, their coursework looks a little bit different, but um, not radically different. I think our pre-health students who are majoring in BME at Pratt just have to be a little bit more mindful about picking up some of the social sciences and humanities coursework, making sure their writing coursework is in place because that's maybe not as integrated into the Pratt curriculum. All right, is nurse aid training offered at Duke? Um, 
Yes. <laughs> she market. Um, we are working in the direction of uh, working with our clinical education department, some of our nursing directors at um, the two Duke hospitals to make this pathway a little more seamless for our students. Um, so while I can't say yes, exclamation point yet, um, we really hope that by fall we have got um, something going on where if students are able to commit one eight hour shift every two weeks um, that you know Duke will invest in training them. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, we're, we're really excited about this possibility. Our partners in the hospitals are excited as well. We just need to work out the logistics, but I, I think it'll be a real um, great opportunity for both our students, um, our hospitals and our patients. The current last question. So if you have other questions, start putting those back in the Q&A. Um, what do our students do for clinical hours? Um, we really like to emphasize for students that what medical schools are telling us they're looking for and what we see our students engaging with the most is what we call patient engagement, because there are times you might be spending time with patients that aren't clinical in nature, but still have a ton of value in your development and in your evolution of understanding why you want to be a physician or other healthcare provider. That might look different depending on different pathways. So I will put the caveat out there right now that for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk pre-med specifically. Um, so a lot of our students will spend time in assisted living or hospital volunteering. So our assisted living, we actually have some service learning courses, which are courses that integrate time in the community that spend time in assisted living or working with patients. And those can be incredibly, incredibly impactful experiences for our students because they're going and they're spending time in the community, interacting with people, and then coming back in an intellectually intellectual setting and talking and reflecting on what those experiences look like. They might be connecting it to systemic issues in our community or globally um, or nationally with a healthcare system. And so there's this really lovely uh, connection between the classroom and being out with um, folks in our community. And those things are things we still highlight on the experiential side um, of your preparation. Uh, we do have a hospital, hospital volunteering program that some of our students will spend time in. And then we have this really cool program, Duke Help, Duke Help Desk, which is where our students are trained to go into the emergency room here at Duke and ask folks who are in the waiting room some questions about screening for community needs. Um, they will support patients if they need something concrete, like a glass of water or have a question, but also are really helping to make sure that the community members who are seeking health care at Duke Emergency Room are getting the social support outside of the hospital. And that is a program that I think for many of our students can really change how they see how community members use healthcare, how they view healthcare, but also they feel like they're making a really tangible difference because they're often able to help these patients not just get better in the moment with healthcare, but also think about how to leverage community resources to make their life better once they leave the emergency room as well. We have Adopt a Grandparent, which is an organization on campus where um, students will spend time with um, older folks who might need help with um, sort of errands or taking care of things in the home and really just spend some time developing relationships there. And then we have lots of experiences that students are having over the summer. They might go do a summer program at another institution um, where they're volunteering at a hospital. Um, some of our clinical research experiences here at Duke have some patient involvement. So sometimes depending on the research um, program that a student is working on, they might be seeing patients as part of that. Um, there's often research programs that are enrolling patients at the ED as well. And so some of our students will do experiences like that, where even though it's part of a research experience, they're also really engaged with patients. And then during our gap years, sometimes our students will spend time doing things like a medical assistant or a CNA. Um, some of our students will do that while they're here too. And then scribing is sort of a job that some of our students will hold while they're here at Duke um, during maybe their last year or so where they are taking notes for physicians and sort of in that space with them. I'm typing an answer, so I'm... Uh... <laughs> okay, there it looks like... Um... How possible is it to get into Duke Med School without a gap year? 
do non-gap year applicants typically only get into their home state school? Um, I don't know uh, the Duke specific data. Uh, and certainly we have, you know, our, our most prepared students um, who are most competitive will get into some impressive schools as junior applicants. But my observation is as an advisor, even really, really good students that I'm confident if they had applied as a senior, they tend to get into their state schools and then just miss on those others. Um, like I had one this year that only got into, you know, interviews at their their top state schools. These are really wonderful schools. But I think if they, he had applied this coming summer, just would have had more choices. So it's really hard for us. We can't give you comparative data because, you know, if students get accepted, they tend to go rather than sit through another cycle. But, um, you know, just based on what I know and think about applicants and then see what happens as juniors compared to um, what I think might have happened had they had another year. I think it's it's the think about it. You've got three years to take all your courses, take your MCAT, get your experiences. It's just compressed. You don't have as much time. Um, you know, if you're comparing that applicant to someone who, instead of planning to write a thesis, has done it and can talk about what they gained from that experience and their thesis mentor can write a letter of recommendation about all the things that they observed with that student in the process of writing a thesis, those two students were just different. And medical schools don't have the pile for junior applicants that they go soft on and the pile for seniors and alumni. They're all in the same pool. And we were really surprised during the pandemic thinking, oh, people can't get into clinics in shadow. They can't volunteer in the same ways and get that patient engagement experience. Surely it'll go easier on everybody. But there were enough resourceful students that went out, got certifications, got jobs, worked on the front lines. All of our students who didn't gain experience like that, they just couldn't compete with those students. And so I think that's what happens to our junior applicants. They can be really fabulous and they can be really wonderful, um, but they're just not going to compete with those students that have another year or two on them of experience. So it happens, absolutely. Can't really give you anything more about the odds, the possibilities, um, but it's something that we'll talk with our students about is, you know, what are your goals? Some people going to their best state school is the most cost-effective way for them to go to medical school, or they want to be near family after being far from family while at Duke, or, you know, some other, you know, values and priorities come in. They do, you know, they they apply and they, they do quite well. So, um, what I can say with certainty is a gap year will increase your competitiveness for an already incredibly competitive process. Um, and so, you know, that's that's about all I can say with certainty about gap years and getting accepted. Dean P, Director Morhack, thank you so, so much for being with us this evening. Um, I was uh, kind of chatting with Colleen, the other admission officer in the back, like, learning so much from the U2. Um, so we appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate all of you who have joined us this evening or this morning, wherever, depending on where you are. I do wanna put in a plug in an hour at seven o'clock, we will have another virtual webinar on residential life and Quad X. And so if you're interested, um, please go to your portal for the Zoom link. Um, but I think we will end things here. So I hope all of you have a wonderful evening. Thanks again to our panelists um, and take care. Thanks for having us. Thank you.